Today, easy upgrades that'll get your truck jacked up without busting a hole in your wallet. You're looking at a 2001 Dodge Ram 1500. It was the first of the big rig Ram style trucks that mimicked its heavy duty cousins. Starting in 1994, the second gen boasted the highest load and tow ratings in the industry, helping Dodge triple their market share in just a few short years. We brought this one in a few weeks ago to troubleshoot some engine codes in the 5.2 liter Magnum V8. It had seriously failed emissions. And on a gas analyzer, we learned it had some ignition problems, registering well over the 220 parts per million limit for hydrocarbons. We checked the codes and found a few. We fixed some serious vacuum leaks and found a disconnected injector wire. After a new thermostat, a tune-up, and new O2 sensors, phase one was complete, and it passed its emission test with flying colors. Oh man, we got this truck all tuned up. It runs pretty smooth, it's bone stock. So we pretty much have a blank slate. You were telling me you were talking to the owner of the truck and he had some things in mind he'd like to do to it. And right, yeah, well, he, in mind? he does, you know, he hunts a little bit. He hauls a dirt bike around, stuff like that. So I'm thinking maybe a mild lift, a little bit bigger tire. That way, nothing too aggressive, but if he wants to get out on the trail or anything like that, this truck would definitely handle it. You know, it's probably time these tires, they're, they're on the OE 20s from a little bit later model truck. And they have an on-road tread. They they got a little bit of wobble to them, and you know I can tell there's definitely one of the shocks is probably not working as well as it used to. The truck balances a little bit, so I think you know some wheels and tires and maybe some shocks will be good to go. Absolutely. Hey, stand on the brakes. See how they work. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> not that good, no. man. Pedal's mushy. You can definitely just feel the weight of the truck just take over. I mean, it's like. The pads aren't grabbing. I say we definitely. Uh, yeah, let's do something about that too. Yeah, I just say we redo the brakes. Let's, well, let's get back to the shop. We'll get some parts ordered, and we'll. Yeah, let's just blow the rest of the day driving around. Let's do it. Got some air conditioning in. Got a nice sunny day. Not a bad way to spend the day. No. Well, it's too bad it doesn't have a little more power. We can have a little more fun. You can throw a Cummins in it, I guess. Yeah, I guess. We don't have time for a Cummins swap today. And since we have some weaknesses in our braking system, we figured we ought to take care of that before we move on to the fun stuff. So to get rid of all of our high mile parts, we went to Ray Bestis. You can think of them as a one-stop shop for all your brake needs. And we started in the front with a pair of their premium rotors. These things are precision machined and mill balanced, so they'll install accurately and they won't give you any pulsation in the pedal. The friction will be provided by their Element 3 brake pads with enhanced hybrid technology. These are a blend between ceramic and semi-metallic compounds, and they'll give you amazing stopping power under the harshest conditions. The pressure will be applied with these new calipers, and they come with the sliders already installed. The old ones often will rust and seize into place, giving you uneven braking. So that'll round out the front. Out back, we grab the obvious stuff, like new shoes and drums. But we also got all the small parts you often don't think about when you do a brake job, like new wheel cylinders, as well as the adjusters and all the springs and hardware needed to do the job right. And we'll get started by tearing down the front. First step is to remove the brake line from the caliper and let the fluid drain into a container. Next, the caliper is unbolted and removed along with the old pads. The caliper bracket is next and the rotor slips right off. I like to clean up any rust with a wire brush to make sure the new rotor sit flat on the hub, preventing any chance of vibration. Now I know what you're thinking. No, I didn't put it on backwards. Most machine parts like this are covered in a light coat of oil so they don't rust during shipping, but don't want that oil to contaminate your fresh brake pads. So always clean it off. I'll clean up the caliper bracket before it goes back on. These are the most important surfaces to keep clean because that's what the brake pads actually slide on. And once I dab some silicone onto the contact areas, our new Raybestos pads can slide into place. Man, you're not about to put those on, are you? Why? Well, you know, probably the first time the truck gets out on the road, I imagine they'll rust over. Well, that oil on there, that'll stop from rusting on uh, it. Yeah, maybe for a day or so. Let me make you a deal. <laughs> What's that? Since I know you don't like getting your hands very dirty. Right. You paint these okay. and the back brake drums, and I'll take care of the rear brakes. I'll make that deal with you. All right, you know, sounds good. You're the one that has the gloves on. 
Ahead, we're back on the Dodge for more upgrades. We're back, about to give a nice coat of paint to our new Ray Bestis calipers and drums. Is this essential when replacing braking components? Well, no, but eventually the factory coating will wear off and these will be covered in rust. So a little prep and a coat of Duplicolor caliper paint will protect them nicely. Now there's a lot going on behind the brake drums of these newer trucks. So one thing I like to do is take a smartphone or a digital camera and snap a bunch of pictures of where everything goes. That way when it's time to reassemble it, you don't have any questions. I'll remove all the small parts that hold the shoes into place. There is a specific order to assembly, so pay attention where everything goes. Unscrew the brake line and the wheel cylinder can come off, completing the disassembly. Put everything back in reverse order, starting with the new wheel cylinder and the rear shoe, connecting the parking brake actuator. Put in the automatic adjuster and the lower springs. Up top, the cable and more springs go in and finish up with the adjustment ratchet. Now when you put these on, you want to make sure there's just a little bit of drag. And we're perfect. If not, we could just space out that adjuster, we'd be good to go. We've got all of our new Ray Bestis brake parts installed, but since we took the brake lines off, the system is now full of air. So we'll use this motive power bleeder to flush out all the old fluid and get rid of the air bubbles. With the reservoir filled with new fluid, LT can attach the bleeder to the master cylinder and pump it up. This tool makes it simple for one person to bleed the brakes. It's recommended to periodically change your brake fluid. And when it runs clear with no bubbles, you know you're good to go. And with the brakes taken care of, now we can address the soft, spongy ride, which I'm told might have something to do with these original shocks still under the truck. But we'll take care of that with a new set of shocks we picked up from Summit Racing. And to provide just enough lift for the tires we have planned, we'll install this Summit 2-inch suspension leveling kit. Now, what's awesome about this? Just a simple bolt in. But breaking loose a shock bolt that hasn't been touched in 15 years required cutting it out. And with the bracket loose, along with the shock, I'll lower the axle, slide the old shock out, as well as the coil spring. The new two inch coil spacer is bolted in first, then the spring, followed by the new shock. And with the axle raised, the upper shock mount goes back in, and everything is secured. Up she goes, and the rear shocks are swapped out. Ooh, watch yourself, easy as pie. With the front of our ram leveled out and new shocks on all four corners, it's time to get some rubber on this bad boy. And we want a tire that's a little bit larger to fill the wheel opening, as well as something that'll get us better traction than those old street tires. These are Continental Terrain Contact ATs, and this new tread design is great for trucks that spend most of their life on the highway. They'll give you a nice, smooth, and quiet ride. But when you want to get off the pavement into the dirt and mud, this all-terrain tread will give you great traction off-road. Plus, you get a 60,000-mile limited tread life warranty. Let's hit the road. Right away, we notice a big difference how this truck drives, especially the handling. Here you can see the before and after, and how a simple leveling kit brought our front end up. The Continental ATs are super quiet on pavement and provide more than enough grip in dirt, gravel, and grass and our heavy-duty OE replacement brake package from Raybestos will give us long life and superior stopping power. Just see for yourself. Next, turning a tired bench seat into a cool couch for your man cave.
We're back on Truck Tech and I'm really digging our new piece of shop equipment, this Conso 206 RB5 sewing machine. And we've got some cool projects lined up for next season where I can put this thing to good use, creating some cool custom upholstery. But that got me to thinking. Earlier this season, Mark Chris from the Detroit Muscle Show got creative with an old small block Chevy that had been laying around their shop. He stripped it down, cleaned it up, slapped on a little paint, and built an engine block coffee table that sits in our front office next to a pouring black Corinthian leather couch. So I thought, what can we do to add to that vibe to give the lobby a little bit more of a hot rod feel? Well, we could throw some custom paint on the walls, maybe even build a cool sign to hang on the wall, but then it hit me. How about a unique couch made from something out of the junkyard? Actually, we picked up this front bench seat out of a 49 Cadillac Fleetwood. We're gonna turn this thing into a couch. Now, I'm gonna tell you, it is huge. You could easily fit three people on this thing. And the plans I have for it, I'm thinking a red vinyl up top and along the facing of the cushion. And for the inserts, we'll do a white vinyl and something cool like tuck and roll. Now, since the lower cushion is solid and it doesn't have this upper strip, I think we'll add a four or five inch red strip in here that goes into the tuck and roll and make it match a little better. But we'll get started with a cushion. The first thing we need to do before tearing the seat down is very important. I'm going to find the center of the cushion, then make lines about six inches apart where each piece of material is sewn together. The lines are where we will make our witness marks, which are references used to sew our new material back to its proper location. If we didn't make these marks, I'd struggle to get all the pieces lined back up. Now I'm going to measure and mark for the red vinyl insert. This will be my cut line. Next is to remove the seat cover, typically held down with haul greens. You can cut them off with a pair of wire cutters or shears. With the cover off the seat, now it's time to separate all the pieces with a razor blade. Now this can be a little time consuming, but this is a good test of patience. You don't wanna just tear it apart and ruin the material. Destroying the material means your template will be cattywampus. Not a good thing. All right, since our cover is so torn up and I wanna try to keep it together as good as I can for a template, I'm just gonna tape over some of these spots, try to hold it together. Now I can make my cut to separate the two pieces. Remember the piece on the left will be flat red vinyl. On the right, our white tuck and roll. All right, this is our insert that's gonna get tuck and roll. And this is what tuck and roll looks like. It looks really cool because all of the stitches are hidden. Now, I call each one of these channels, and our insert, I get about 40 of them. Now, when you sew tuck and roll, it tends to shrink a lot. So for every four channels, we're gonna lose about an inch. So I'm gonna cut my material way bigger than it needs to be. And once we get it all sewn up, we can come back, lay our insert over the top of our tuck and roll, trace it out, we're good to go. First, I can cut out the white vinyl and get it to a manageable size. Then the same with the scrim foam. Two coats of 3M trim adhesive on both sides will hold it together nicely. Now we can lay out the lines to sew the pleats, starting with the absolute center. I'll make my marks two inches wide, which happens to be the width of my ruler. Over to the machine, I can begin laying down stitches. All I'm doing is making a top stitch on the material following each of my lines I just marked. These lines of stitches will end up being our guides for the next step. After about an hour or so running a stitch on all the pleats, I can start with the actual stitch that provides the tuck and roll effect. It starts by folding the material right where the stitch lines are and I'm sewing a quarter inch to the inside all the way down the material. More patience and play here. These are the actual stitches your butt will rest on, so they better be straight. Once the last channel is sewn, I can move on to the next step. With the old insert laid down on the new piece, I'll transfer my alignment marks. Then cut it to size. These witness marks are made on the outer edge of the tuck, 
and won't be seen, but they will help me line everything up. Moving on to the front panel, I'll lay out the old piece and transfer it over to the red. The process is the same here, transferring marks to help line everything up. An extra half inch to the top for seam allowance will give us plenty of material to sew to when we stitch the two pieces back together. At the machine, I'm running a border stitch right along the edge of the material just to lock the foam and vinyl together. Now this stitch will never be seen and we can follow the same steps for the facing material. We're back on Truck Tech resurrecting and converting this original 49 Cadillac bench seat into a nice tuck and rolled couch for our front lobby. The assembly of our pieces is pretty simple. I'm sewing the two inserts together, laying them face to face, making sure to keep the edges even. And I've lined up the stitch a half inch in on all the pieces. Now this half inch is referred to as seam allowance. Now, don't get me wrong, Upholstery is definitely a learned skill, but it's something that anyone can do with a little practice and a decent sewing machine. Oh, and don't forget, patience. Most folks are intimidated by sewing machines, but in my opinion, running the machine is probably the easiest part of the job. Buy a good used machine, get some material, and go to town. Now the web is a great resource for how-to videos, along without show, of course. Tuck and roll looks pretty cool. Oh, one down, one to go. I went ahead and progressed the project. I've sewn the backrest together and everything's coming together pretty nicely, but there's one thing I still needed to add, and that's what we call a listing. It's basically one piece of material that's folded over and sewn together. It gives me a channel to run a piece of rod through. Now what this allows you to do is put a hog ring in and it really bites down on it and you don't have to worry about your hog ring ripping through the material if you didn't have a rod. You'd sit down, you'd rip it, it'd just be a big mess. But before we get to that, there's something pretty cool I wanna show you. This is actually the original seat cover that came out of the 49 Cadillac. And normally we'd rip this off and we'd re-foam it and all that good stuff, but man, since it survived this long, we'll just leave it for the next guy. This seat cover and many covers from back in the day were hog ringed in. So we're going to use that same process. Hog ring fasteners have been around forever. They're really cheap and you can get them and these specialty pliers at pretty much any hardware store. This pair from Matco Tools are spring loaded so when you open them up and put a hog ring in, they clamp down on it and hold it in place. They make attaching fabric to a frame super simple. Looks good. I really like that. It's a cool look. What do you think, LT? It looks pretty sweet. I like it a lot. Man, I knew I'd find you sitting down somewhere. Heck yeah, I got the best seat in the house. You know, this is a pretty cool addition to anybody's man cave or den, and it really wasn't that much work, was it? No, I mean, this isn't really a beginner project with the tuck and roll, because quite a few hours in that, but I mean, you have a little patience, you can knock it out. Well, it's a good look, but let's get back to work. Let's do it. I'll put one of those in my living room. Yeah, man, your wife would kill you. It doesn't matter how big or small your cleanup job is around the garage. Gunk all-purpose cleaner and degreaser can handle it. It's highly concentrated, which means you can dilute it down to 35 to 1 for light-duty cleaning. Or for the heavy stuff, you can use it straight out of the container. This gallon jug goes a long way for cleaning outdoor power equipment, your barbecue grill, or even automotive parts with a greasy or oily surface. Gunk all-purpose cleaner and degreaser is available at your favorite automotive retailer. Leave it to the engineers at Duplicolor to figure out a way to maintain your factory finish while protecting it at the same time. This is their new clear truck bed coating. It lays down an impact resistant coating that has no pigment to it, so your factory color shines through. It can be applied with a roller, spray gun, or aerosol can. It costs way less than a drop-in bed liner. That's great for running boards, bed rails, inner fender wells, you name it. For more information, go to Duplicolor.com. Thanks for watching Truck Tech. See you next time.